So now we learned a little bit more about the human being that he has a spirit. And I think that it's very interesting and very, I don't know, scary in a way that we have a world where science has taught us that we are just one entity, we're just chemistry. And this really limits our understanding of ourselves. And I think it's very interesting how we can see from nature what's possible and what's not possible. And nature teaches us how do we really work as a human being. And I think this is vital information to understand why we get sick. And of course, it's vital information to know how we get healthy again. And uh, I call this meeting the spirit of man and the subconscious. Because we have a spirit and we need to know how that spirit works, of course. And a part of our spirit is completely unknown to us. Those things that goes on underneath our awareness, things that happens very quickly. I'm pretty sure that most of you will recognize and some, some thoughts go very fast and you barely notice they're there, but you still see that you react in a situation. So I think it's, it's good to know how that works. Um, and just to go back over a few things that I think is very important to understand. Stephanie was talking about this law and this whole seminar is called the law of life because this law is what helps us understand what is possible and what is not possible. And it's the measurement of understanding the world we live in. And it's the measurement for understanding ourselves and getting to know how to function or how to treat ourselves and treat others to function well and function correctly. But it's also our measurement in understanding what is truth and what is not. Because it's the only thing that will not change no matter from which direction you look at it. You can turn it around, you can look at it from one point, you can look at it from another point, and it doesn't change. Everything you read, language will change, people will change, everything around us will change, except the laws of nature. They do not change, and because they do not change, it is the only thing that's reliable as a measurement. So we came to understand that to have reliable results, to have a firm understanding of how to treat disease, I must start out with an unchangeable and reliable measurement. And this has to be the foundation of my study. If I don't have this as the foundation of my study, where will I end with the study? I could end up anywhere, yeah? And this is what we see in science very much. We go to one doctor and he says, oh, drink some more water. And we go to another doctor and he has a prescription, prescription for something. And we go to a third doctor and when the doctor doesn't know what to do, then we go to the physiotherapist because the physiotherapist knows things that the doctor doesn't know. And when we've been everywhere, in the end, we tend to give up or some people search for a more spiritual approach, which is good. And it might bring you healing for a while. Mm -hmm. But what will tell if what we found is really truth? If it's really the cure? If the disease stays away, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't have other things coming up, because this is typically the issue is we treat one thing and something else pops up. Yeah? yeah. So this unchangeable foundation and this measurement of our study, the only way we can come to unity as doctors or dentists or whoever we are, is if we have the same type of measurement. Now this one over here measures centimeters. And if you take, this one is not stretchable, but you could probably find, you know, these bendy ones that you go around to measure your waist. I don't know, that's maybe a woman thing. <laughs> if you pull it maybe very hard, the centimeters might expand a little bit. And is it then, you can you use it then? No, it has to be something that does not change whatever you do to it. And this is the laws we see in nature. So can you use the measurement incorrectly? Yes, of course, the human being is not infallible. He makes mistakes, so he might take the measurement and he turns it upside down or he doesn't know to fold it or he breaks it or whatever. So you can use the measurement incorrectly. You can also ignore the measurement but is the measurement still a measurement? Is it still objective? Is it still unchangeable? 
yes, it's still unchangeable. It may take some time to learn to use the measurement, but the measurement will eventually, if we persist, help us to reach, build a building or come into unity, you know, the builders with the building plan. If they have the measurement, every one of them, and they are taught how to use it, when they become well-educated, they might not discover all the same things. Stephanie might use the measurement in one way and she sees the world and she experienced things that I might not experience. And I use the measurement and I read my Bible or I have an experience and I find something that she may not have found out yet. But if we use the same measurement, what we find will never contradict each other. It will supply each other. Yeah? So we need time to learn how to use the measurement. But we also must understand that when we find new discoveries with our measurement, we might learn something that other people have not seen yet. But those things will supply each other. If something contradicts each other in the knowledge we encounter, then we must know that either one of us is not using the measurement correctly. Yeah? So it'd be good to know how to use the measurement correctly and what makes us sometimes use it wrong. Yeah? So I am perceiving that most of the people in here are Christians. And most of you must be familiar with the parable that Jesus talks about in Luke. He says there are two kinds of people. In one man, he builds his house on sand and when the wind comes, it blows over. And another man in Luke, I like the parable very much from Luke because he says, another man digs deep to lay the foundation on the rock. And I'd like to ask you, what is it that he has to dig up first? Clay. Yeah, what does the clay symbolize? Well, the, there's a root of everything, of course. But as I understand it, what we must dig up first, we have an issue inside that must be dug up, but we have this system of beliefs already. And when we build upon that system of belief that is not upon the rock, what happens? It's shaky, yeah? If you build upon something other than the rock, your measurement and your results of the what you do or the study you do will not be firm. And as I believe that this world is coming to an end very soon, I think it's very important for the Christians to know exactly what they believe and why they believe it. Yeah? Because we have also something to teach other people. And there's a lot of people who needs the, this information. Yeah? So we have the unchangeable means for our study, which is the laws of nature, which determine how we function. Then we have the nature of man, our structure and how we function, which is according to law, we saw that. And then we have the basic needs, what's the need, the need we have to, that has to be fulfilled to be, to be able to function. And this law is what everything functions according to. So it's just, it's not just the human being, it's everything in nature. And this is something we would have to go and test for ourselves. It would be a sad thing. What often happens is that we are given an information from someone who comes and says something which is convicting or very appealing or interesting. And we take the information without going and checking it for ourselves. And what Stephanie pointed out is that when then the speaker has a bad rumor or he doesn't live up to our expectations, then we throw the information away because we look to the speaker instead of the information. And another thing that happens often is that we might have a tendency to believing things because it sounds like it's correct, but we don't check it. And where do we end if we believe something that is incorrect? 
in a really bad place. Yeah. So it's very important to understand that if we want to understand how we get sick and how we get well again, we must go and test the information for ourselves. We cannot believe what somebody else says, but this goes into our, all of our lives. You know, if you if you believe you're a Christian, if you if you're a Christian, you you also believe you have a responsibility towards other people. And then you must know why you believe what you believe so that you can explain it to another one that does not have the same information. Yeah. And it would be good that these people get a firm foundation of what we believe in a way that they can understand it. Explained to reason. Yeah. So nothing can live or function from itself. Nothing has energy from itself. It must take something from outside. And nothing can live or function for itself. It must give an effect in the other end. Everything works like a channel. It has a cause. It has an effect. We have an entrance where things go in. And we have an exit where the effect comes out. And at the beginning, the channel must take. And in the end, it must give. And this way, everything works in a circuit. Now, is one, if one thing in this circuit breaks, if just one channel is broken, what happens to the rest of the circuit? Is this the world we live in? Yeah. So you see, if, just, if we just have one belief that's incorrect, just one, we will be breaking the circuit. This is how important it is to understand what is truth or not. If we are one broken channel in the circuit of life, then the circuit of life is not vital anymore. That's a very serious matter. Yeah. Big responsibility or little responsibility? I think it's a very big responsibility. But I think it's a very beautiful responsibility. And I think it's the I think it's the greatest privilege to have that responsibility. We learned that physical things can only react, they cannot react or they cannot act on their own. So when a stone gets warm from the sunshine, we know that the stone must take something to give something it has no choice it cannot go to the shadow cannot hide itself in the in the cliff <laughs> i mean in the cliff there are cold stones but if it's out in the sun it must take sunshine and produce heat if we see the water moving no one will look and see if the water moved itself but they might look for a boy or a girl who threw a stone or a, a buck climbing on the top of it and when we see the little seeds go off a dandelion. We will look for a girl who blew on it or the wind pushing it. And we know, every one of us, that shoes do not move by themselves, nor do feet. So the brain cell, as a singular cell, will never produce electricity. It will never think. And if you have a bunch of them ordered in a nice manner, they will not think either. So we must have a spiritual organ that governs the body because the body does not move by itself. So we have the soul made of spirit and body and only when they work together, we have the spirit here, we have the brain cortex, then the electricity goes from the brain cortex to the limbic system, which creates the feelings we have or the emotions. And then the electricity goes to the rest of the body and the brain cortex and the spirit, plus the rest of the body, of course, but the brain cortex is where the thoughts go on with the spirit. And those two make up the soul. We have the thoughts and the electrical impulses and from one side to another in both directions, except the, the cranial uh, nerves. Most of the cranial nerves supply the same side. Only a few of them crosses over. I know the eyes and I, I don't remember all the, the few others, but you can study it out. It's very easy to find. So where does the disease come from? I see a lot of children with cavities in my practice. Uh, I have not fortunately had the 
sad situation where I had to talk to a patient about cancer yet. But we see people in and out of hospitals, people with heart attacks, severe diseases, and even just the cold. And they all come from what we think. So where is the beginning of these thoughts? We know they start in the spirit. But what is thinking? It is the evaluation or processing of information we encounter. And then they are followed by decisions. And they come from the spirit that perceives information through our five senses. So we see things, we hear things, we touch things, we taste things. And the information goes to the cortex and to the spirit. And then we have an evaluation of the information we meet. And the information we meet can be read, it can be heard, it can be tasted, it can be smelled, it can be felt. Could be an action of another person that we see, a touch, a sound in a voice. You see, I have another, I mean, my sister uh, and I were driving to Copenhagen as we had to go on the plane. And I have, a, my car is my treasure, among other things. It gives me great liberty, at least I believe so, still, even though I know it's a deception. <laughs> and um, I have a very great need to control my sister's driving when she's driving my car. <laughs> and it's horrible. And I cannot stop it. And I thought to myself, this time I don't say anything. It doesn't matter when she shifts gears. It doesn't matter what she does. I will not comment. But you see, my sister, she knows me very well. So I try to stay very still. <laughs> and I try to distract myself and do something else. And she looks at me and she smiles. <laughs> because my, just my breath <laughs> and my, just my countenance, she can just, she just sees it immediately. So even a touch or just the sound in the voice or just the way you breathe is an information you let out, okay? Then we have, uh, of course, we have the Bible, a text in a book or any other book and the audible sound of music or voice or whatever, yeah. And the entrance of all this information is, here we have the spirit and the brain cortex and the system. We have the ears, we have the nose, we have the mouth, we have the hand, we have the eye. Now the question is, of course, do the eyes see? Who sees for you? The spirit, yes. So the eyes react to the outside and takes in information, but only the spirit can process and understand this information, yeah? So the eyes doesn't see anything. The hand doesn't feel anything. The feet do not walk. But the spirit controls the whole body so that it functions according to the spirit, yeah? And before any of our decisions are made before we have any emotion or before we have any action. We must first have evaluation of information. So whenever I push a button, there is evaluation of information going on in my spirit. Whenever I lift a water bottle, whatever I do, there must be a perception of information before I do it. So how much do you think, how much time do you think we spend on thinking? It never stops. Yeah. The spirit is always active. It, I don't know how many thoughts a second. Probably there's some kind of measurement on the electricity about that. But we never stop thinking. We think constantly. Now, how much do we eat? How, how much time do we spend on eating? or exercising in general? Not, not 
<laughs> not enough. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it depends. Exercising, probably not enough. Eating, probably more than we should, <laughs> at least in this part of the, of the world. The interesting thing I find is that in science, we spend a lot of time, and not only in science, but, but everywhere we go, when we look to the last, even just, I would say, especially the last three and a half years, of course, because of the crisis, but even before this, there was so much time, so much time goes into eating the right food, eating at the right time, and not eating for a long time, like fasting, yeah, and juice, fasting, and exercising in the round amount, and all these things. You see, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of time spent on these things in the medical system. And not only in the medical system, but it takes up the media, it, it takes up everything, yeah? How much time do we spend on understanding why we think what we think? Isn't it interesting? I think it's very interesting. It is as if the most vital part of our being has completely been overlooked for centuries. We are, of course, a system that runs on two things. We have chemicals, we need, chem we need chemistry, we need food. And it does matter. It does matter if you drink water or diesel. The human being does not run very nicely on diesel, of course. But when you look to how much time you spend on eating compared to how much time you spend on thinking, I would, in any case, with any patient, look to his thoughts before I would look to his diet. But no one does this. I, I, it's just a, a nice thought that I've had. Of course, I'm, I've known the message for a long time. I haven't understood it for as long as I've known it. But as I came to understand it more and more, and even in university, I was provoked a little bit by this fellow friend we have, um, a doctor from Germany. And he came to, uh, to present some meetings in Copenhagen where I studied. And one morning we were eating breakfast together. And I spread my great knowledge about how acid from juice and other sour uh, products would make uh, acid damage on your, on your teeth. And he asked me, can you prove it? <laughs> and I was a little bit offended. <laughs> Not much. I knew he was teasing me. But his, his question had a very, very nice impact on me because I started studying my patients even when I was in school. I didn't understand everything yet, but I started studying my patients and I started questioning the, the knowledge that I was given in school. And I thought to myself, if sugar is really the cause of the cavities, then why does a cavity only appear in one tooth? If sugar is really the, the issue of cavities in humanity, then why do I have patients? And I see that especially now I have a, um, a nice family that comes to the practice with their kids. And uh, I, some of the kids I know a little bit better. They're a little bit scared of the dentist. Some people are scared of the dentist. I, I don't understand, <laughs> but that's how it is. And so this girl, she was a little bit scared. And so then they connect to only one um, dentist because they attach themselves to the one that fulfill their needs better or they think they, they can fulfill their need from the dentist. And so the father asked me of this girl, we brush her teeth so much and we do not feed our children very much sugar. Why does she still get cavities? And I see it over and over and over. And what we teach the parents is to brush some more, to eat less sugar, to make sure you don't flush the mouth with water after you brush to let the fluoride stay there. And we have many, many things, but we do not get rid of the cavities. We have even statistics that helps us see that some, some years it's better, some years it's worse. And I was thinking to myself, if sugar is really the cause, because it was a very hard thing for me to let go of this thought. If sugar is, very, is, is really the cause of cavities, then why can my sister eat what she wants for almost all of her life and even sometimes go to bed without brushing her teeth? never have a cavity in her life. 
And I would brush my teeth at least every night. And I would have, I had in two years, I had about 11 cavities when I was a child. We were in the same house. We ate mostly the same diet. But still, there was a difference. So things like these, you know, it has to be a little thought provoking. I have people that come into the practice and normally if you have a, um, an abscess or you have a nerve infection, you will have a cavity. I have people coming into my practice or the practice I work at with an abscess and an infection and with pain, and there is no visible cause, not a single filling, not a single cavity, not a single um, pocket around the tooth. And still, I tell you, the pain is very real and the pus is very <laughs> real, but no apparent cause. And I like it that when I bring these things up to my colleagues, they say, oh, maybe there was an apple peel coming down. Besides, you know, if we don't have a cause, we make up one. Maybe there was an, an invisible, invisible factor in the tooth that you can only see if you pull out the tooth. I like to have better answers to my patients than that. So before we make any decision, or we have any emotions or we do any actions, we must have some kind of evaluation. And this is how it works. The information comes into our ear, for example, the sound and the voices we hear. And it goes to the spirit. The spirit perceives and processes this information. And these thoughts, they lead to a decision. And the decision we make makes the electrical impulses in our brain. And then we have feelings and emotions and actions and bodily reactions. And thereby we have the brain being the capital city, you could say. The spirit rules the capital city as a king that rules his kingdom. And he puts the electricity to go from the body into every limb and into every organ. And then the body will do what the spirit tells him to do. You know, you got to quantify the spirit. And, and you've got to quantify this. You know the brain is and everything else is. Well, the spirit, spirit is spirit. the spirit is above the cortex, but it's invisible. But it must be in connection with the with the brain because the two work together. Well, yeah, yeah, obviously. Well, yeah. No, we cannot, we cannot see it, so we can only prove it by ruling out that matter can move itself. Yeah. yeah? So there's some information that we can look up, we can look in a book, we can touch things, but there's some information that we must know by proving what is not possible. Yeah? So this is a negative proof. Nothing can move by itself, so we must have a spirit. You've done well, right? Well, that's <laughs> well, I practice arguing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I practice doing it in the right way, though. <laughs> so the first case study I brought up is myself. This is a 12-year-old girl with cavities and back pain. Now, should a 12-year-old have back pain? No. No. Should anyone have back pain, though? No, of course not. But 12 years is very, way, way too soon to have back pain. And uh, when I was about 12 years old, or a little bit, yeah, I think 12 years old, my parents divorced and um, we moved from one place to another. And people tell me, maybe you brushed less, maybe you ate more sugar, but I tell you, when you move from your mom and to, uh, from, your, from your family and to your mom's place, is, is, more, is mom more concerned about health or is dad more con concerned about health? Mom. mom, of course. This is how it is. Women care much more about their health. And men never have any problems, you know. They never have any disease. They're never stressed. They're never, yeah. Is this? Well, <laughs> you cannot say it generally. I mean, my dad is a very sensitive man. If I asked him if he's, if he's stressed, he would say, yes, I'm stressed. But many men, when you ask them, they will say, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. So when they divorced, or before they divorced, I had the intake of information. I had loving thoughts. I felt free at least to some extent. We had some issues in the family, of course. 
and the electrical impulses were good. Now, the information of the divorce, or at least the conflict going on between my parents. Oh, over here, I have good emotions. I have three actions. I'm a healthy kid. I'm well functioning. And I have health. And I would say I, and I know that she would agree with me. I was the more harmonious kid in the family. Whenever we went to school counselings, my mom would always hear, oh, she's such a good girl. She keeps the class together. Everyone wants to be her friend. I won over every adult. I was very charming. And then the conflict came. And apparently, there is an error that makes me have thoughts of disappointment, of hurt, of revenge. And I found myself in captivity. And the harmony changed very radically, my sister tells me. I became very bossy. I would boss everyone around, but especially my father, because you sympathize with one or the other in the family. And my poor father had much trouble with me because he also is much in need of harmony. So whenever his girls are not happy with him, he of course got into trouble. And the electrical impulses that would go through my body would be those of disease. As 12 year old, uh, I had to see a physician about my back, the right side, and it would come up from time to time. Uh, the pain and it actually it kept with me for a while but then I had a, a period of, of a pause when I came in high school it would start again I moved away from home for high school for three years and uh, at some some days when I was just 15 or, or 16 it would be so bad that I would sit in school to do the studies and then when we had the eating break I would eat my food very fast because then I could go to my room and rest and lie down before I had to go to class again, because I couldn't sit straight up. It was, it was too painful. And even in the small breaks between classes, if we just had five minutes, I would go to the bench outside of the classroom and lie down to just ease the pain a little bit. So the error in my spirit, the way I perceived the information around me, the way I perceived the conflict in the family, resulted in bad emotions and untree actions and in disease. Now, it would be nice to know how to help a 12 year old like this, would it? Because probably a lot of things are going on in her thinking. And the body is just telling exactly what goes on inside of the girl, yeah? So we need to know a few things about the spirit. It does the production of thoughts and it lives from information from outside and it lives on love. So it functions well on love and it doesn't function on anything else. It works like a channel like everything else. So it must take in the information to pass it on but it is only governed from the inside. So it's a channel, but it can only take information in itself. No one can do the intaking of information. Yeah. And the outcome also must be done by the spirit himself. No one can enter into the spirit. No one can think for you. And something very nice about the spirit, something I really love is that the spirit can never be forced. Do you like when someone tries to force you to do something? Isn't it very nice that you can say no? Isn't it very nice that if someone tells you to do something that you really don't want to do, you have a no? Yeah. I absolutely love it. I think it's very, very wonderful. So you can never force a spirit to do anything. But if you have something you believe he needs, 
you can negotiate with him. But he must believe that you have something he needs. I have a very nice story from just recently before we lived at home. I had a, I had a girl, um, not so old, maybe seven or eight years old, and she had some cavities in her primary teeth. And a few of them I decided to put fillings into, but a few of them were a little bit bigger. And I sometimes you decide in a loss, should we fix it or should we pull the tooth? Because a new one is coming out soon. And you reduce the, at least you believe you reduce the, the risk of the girl having any pain. So I wanted to pull the tooth. And um, some children are very cooperative and are not afraid at all. But this girl was very much afraid. Can you ever pull a tooth on a girl who does not want to have the tooth pulled? <laughs> I see a mother up there. What happens if your child decides to close her mouth? Can you do anything about it? No, it's a lost cause. Yeah. If the child decides it will not do it, you can do nothing. Now, the child had an, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, I agree. An agreement with the mom. The mom, you know, the moms, they are smart. They think, how can I negotiate? Because we need the child to cooperate, yeah? So they think, how can I buy her? And the child had apparently this um, promise that she could get something more expensive from the store when the tooth has been pulled. But she was so afraid that she could not cooperate to have the tooth pulled, yeah? yeah? And I thought, okay, now we talk to her and mothers are very persistent. Normally, I have maybe 30 or 40 minutes put to, um, to pull a tooth. And even if the child will not do it in the beginning, I cannot know for sure. I mean, some, some children come around after a little bit of talking. But if half an hour of talking has passed, I have not yet experienced a child will come around. But the mother will use all the time that we have. And even if all the time has passed, she will say, oh, maybe you will do it now when they're on the way out of the door. <laughs> and I think to myself, oh, well, I have other patients. <laughs> but they're very persistent. So the mom said, so, okay, we talked to the girl and we tried all measurements and she just, she wouldn't do it. And in the end, the time was gone and we decided to just leave it alone and see what happens. And then um, the girl will not leave the room. And I was astonished because I thought she doesn't want to have a, tooth pulled, but she doesn't want to leave the room either. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe she was, you know, some children really want to please their mom. So they would like to do it for mom so that mom can be happy. And I thought it was like this. And I tried to say, oh, it's all right. And, and the mom was, you know, being understanding also. I, I liked her very much. And then um, I tried to talk to the child and she says, well, if I leave without having my tooth pulled, I cannot get my present. <laughs> This child, I liked her so much because she has a stubbornness maybe on the size of my own. So she was in so much trouble because no matter what she would do, she would be in loss. Yeah, there was no way of gaining what she needed because she could not have the tooth pulled. So I thought it was a very interesting, interesting story. So sometimes you can negotiate, but if it's, Spirit has decided it will not cooperate. You can do nothing about it. I even, I have children that I give with this uh, laugh, laughing gas, we call it in Danish. I don't know if it's saying, yeah. yeah. And yeah. laughing gas can sometimes makes it more easy for the child, but the child must have a cooperative spirit or it cannot be done. She is still more awake and can still say something and stuff like that while the laughing gas is on. If that doesn't work, I have a medication we give for sedation, they are still awake, but they're very, um, very, yeah, they become very tired and they won't remember anything afterwards. And they, some of them don't speak very well and they talk about weird things. They become very drugged, yeah? And even then, the child, if it has made up its mind, you can do nothing about it. I thought it was, very amazing when I, I, the first child I sedated, 
would not corrupt. I had expected that when you put the child almost to sleep, at least the spirit must cooperate. But if he, she has decided that she cannot do it, you can do nothing about it. You can put her to sleep, of course, with the, with the general anesthetics. So the spirit cannot be forced. It can only be negotiated with if you have something it needs. And it must need this thing more than, it must be a, a greater loss not to get this thing than to have the tooth pull. Yeah. And the spirit is always active. He's never passive. So the electrical current is ongoing in our bodies and affected and controlled by what we think. So every time we think something which is good, we have the correct electrical current in our nerves. But as soon as we have a little annoyance somewhere, then we have an electrical current for our body, which it doesn't need. Yeah? So this, I think, is the greater place to look for, or the, the smarter way to look for where diseases start. When we have an effect in the end of giving, which is bad, we must recognize that something must be wrong in the end of the input. Now, either it has to be wrong on the outside, so that which is that which is outside is not what we need, so it's the wrong intake, or something must be wrong inside of the channel. Okay? So either the cause must be, you know, with a tree, if it doesn't get, have water, then the cause must be the lack of water. Yeah? But if it is not outside, which is with plants, then it must be inside. And the effect will always correspond to the cause. So if the effect is bad, it proves that something must be wrong in the other end. That means if I have disease in any kind, if I have bad emotions, something over here must be wrong because the right input will always give the right output. And the wrong output shows that something is wrong in the other end. So the question is, where does the human being begin? We know that from thoughts follows feelings and actions, but where does the thought begin? What is the starting point? What determines if we have good thoughts or bad thoughts? Why do we think what we think and why do we do what we do? I think these questions are very important to know and to study if disease is really caused by what we think. What happens inside of us that we don't know goes on is what happened in me when my parents got divorced. And this is what happens subconsciously because of course it's, I think it's obvious that children are affected by conflict around them. But it would be nice to know what exactly, how exactly does it work? And also, because at the time I, I came, when my parents decided to divorce, they had been fighting for a long time. And I would hear them when I was upstairs. And um, as much as I, of course, wanted my family to stay as a family, I was very affected by the conflict and I really didn't like it. And um, so one day when I came home from, I was at a birthday party, I came home and my parents told me they were going to divorce. And I thought, oh, okay. And I went to my room and I went to sleep. I didn't shed a tear, which is strange for me because I'm a very easy, I'm very easily uh, going to tears. But, I, but the conflict was, was not what I needed. So I took it very easily, but, but my body showed that even though I looked like I was fine, still something was going on inside. Which was, and I think it's very important that we know because we might not 
see or we because it's some subconscious we don't see what it is that we're thinking which is wrong but we will see it on our body and we will experience it in what we feel our emotions that come up so whenever we see disease on our bodies or whenever we recognize irritation or anger or sadness or anxious uh, anxiousness or whatever we experience it would be very nice to know what goes on before this happens so that I'm able to control what happens and able to react in a different way. Now, children, are, of course, they have to have a specific age. We'll go into a little bit more how we can help the children. Uh, they have to have a certain age before you can help them understand how, how they work because they're still developing. But as adults, we should have the knowledge so that we can apply it to ourselves and so that we can help the children be educated to know how to govern themselves, yeah? So this is the consciousness of the spirit. Up here we have the consciousness, everything we know about. I call it also the will. And here we have the subconsciousness. And uh, some of you will also see it in the Bible described as the heart. You know from Jeremiah that nobody knows the heart. Yeah. So in the consciousness, we have the entrance of information. We are aware of physical and spiritual needs. This is everything we are aware of. Like a screen, a computer screen, it shows us things visible to us. We are aware of them. And we register information in the surroundings around us. And we have the signals and information of the physical needs from the body that Stephanie was also talking about. We have the hunger and we have the thirst and we have the tiredness. And why do we have these things? What do they help us with? Survival. Survival, yes. How? To understand we need to fulfill our needs. Yeah? Because no one can drink for us. Yeah, no one can eat for us. No one can sleep for us. It would be nice sometimes. <laughs> I'd like a little bit more if anyone could sleep in the corner over there for me. I'm <laughs> still a little bit jet lagged. But it's not possible. And it's good because we have to learn to take the responsibility. So when I'm thirsty, I realize I need water and I go to the water well or to the fountain or the whatever I have. Yeah. And likewise, we have spiritual needs. And they are different for different individuals. The needs are the same, but the amount is different or the preference is different. So some people, I, I like harmony a lot, a lot. I'm not the most harmonious person, but I like to have it around. I like to be around harmonious people. I like security and I like liberty. Something I really don't like is when people correct me or they tell me what to do, it goes very much against my needs. And the subconsciousness works with only two decisions or two buttons, you can say. The subconscious must decide something to be gain or to be loss. So gain is to fulfill my needs or to not fulfill my needs fulfill my needs yeah so the spirit or the subconscious must always act according to fulfilling its needs it can never go towards not fulfilling its needs loss would be to not fulfill its needs yeah the human being cannot bear not to have his needs fulfilled he might be able to go without water for a little bit of time. He may be able to go for without food for a, a while. But if you don't do something about it, you will die. And the same goes for the spiritual needs. If you have a signal telling you something is wrong, the supply of the spiritual needs are not, is not in order, and you do not do something about it, you will die from disease or you will kill yourself. At some point, you must 
deal with the issue or you must die. That's a little radical, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's radical. I like radical. I like that things are very absolute because it gives an idea of what is possible and what is not possible. If we don't have an answer for what is possible and not possible, we will be in a gray area and we will not be able to help anyone. But if we know exactly what is possible and exactly what is not, uh, not possible, we will know exactly how to help the patient. Anything outside which is not stable, which is not trustable, or I don't know, that's not an English word, I think, trustworthy, you, you will not be able to use it because it may be true, it may not be true. But if you have something very absolute, you know, this is truth, this I can apply. I would not like information that I was not certain about. I would never want to give my patient information that I think maybe, maybe not. Yeah, they do, but I would not like to do that. Yes, and everything was very insecure. And, you know, yeah. Don't no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I probably trust you. you. Well, you should never trust me. Please don't trust me. But but it's vital. And this is why we need a tool. We need a tool to test the information that comes from those kinds of places, from all kinds of places, yeah? Because we might believe what the expert says and what he says may be true, but what he says may not be true. We don't want something that's shakable. We want something that we can rely upon whatever happens. And this is reliable. Whatever happens, this is reliable. But you have to test it for yourself. You never trust the expert. Follow the money. Sorry? I say follow the money. Follow the money? Yes, right. So if people are making money out of telling you something, well, therefore, possibly, that it might not be exactly true. Well, that could be true. I'm sure there are money-making people that are very honest, too. <laughs> I'm not sure we can put it like like into that, but you, I mean, whatever, we should never trust anyone whether they make money or not. <laughs> I think. <laughs> so what we must do in our subconscious is to go for the gain, for the treasure. Maybe some of you read Matthew chapter six, where it says, "The heart needs what." It needs a treasure. Wherever the treasure is, the heart will go. Yeah? The heart must always go for the gain. He can never go for the loss. It's absolutely impossible. Now, perceiving my spiritual needs fulfilled creates correct electric, uh, electrical impulses in the brain for the supplying of the body. And loss must always be avoided. Yeah? Whenever I go to fulfill my needs and I perceive them to be fulfilled, it will create, create, or where I perceive them to be fulfilled, it will create electricity in my brain. And I will go for action if I see that I can gain. But if I see that I will lose, I will not fulfill my needs, then I will not act. Then I will avoid the situation. So either I must act to fulfill or to avoid the loss, I will have no action or at least I will have um, either I will have no action or I will have an action that avoids the situation. Yeah. So the information comes into the spirit. I perceive a need of harmony or whatever. I see if that information I need fulfill the needs of my harmony. I make a decision based on gain or loss, and it produces thoughts and actions or no action. Mm -hmm. Now, what gives us trouble is when we are forced into what we believe is loss, unfulfilled needs. So perceiving loss to be unavoidable creates bad electrical impulses in the brain. 
it gives bad emotions, uncontrolled behavior, and disease. And we must know that when this happens, something is wrong in the beginning of the channel. Whenever I have a disease, I was sick not so long ago, actually. Well, but whenever I have a disease, I know I'm wrong. Something must be wrong. I may not know exactly what is wrong, but I know something is wrong. And then I go to investigate what is wrong. Recently, over New Year's, we had a conflict in the family and uh, I got very sick. And I thought to myself, it's amazing. I still get sick. <laughs> I know the information. <laughs> you just put it into practice. <laughs> and um, I couldn't put it into practice, yeah? But it's, it's good, you know, you see, you see the subconscious, it tricks you. And um, after a while, I, I found the error of my mind. <laughs> I think it's one of those that need a little bit more work. <laughs> and um, I, um, I still had a little bit of coughing, actually, when we, I got sick just after New Year's Eve. And I was sick for maybe a week or a little bit more. And I got better and I thought, oh, that's very nice. Maybe I took care of the problem, but the coughing stayed with me. You know, this coughing, it only comes when you lie down and you want to sleep. <laughs> and then it comes and you lie awake for hours and you're like, maybe if I put more pillows <laughs> then I can sleep from it. And sometimes it went a little bit away and then it comes back. And it hasn't been here when we've been in Australia, I think at least. I don't remember it's been here, so, but I think I still, yeah, need to work out what happened, yeah. But I have a very nice case with this issue of loss. I had um, a very um, nice gentleman come to my practice. And um, I think maybe he was in his 60s, in the beginning of his 60s. And um, I was very happy. He had gone to the hygienist before he came come to me. And you know, the, at least in Denmark, the hygienist, she make sure that everything is cleansed. She cleanses the teeth and she, she, they have in their education program something called the motivated conversation or mo motivational conversation. And none of the dentists have this. We barely have anything about psychology or how to approach a patient. But in the hygienist uh, education, they have all these things of how, how to talk to the patient, how to motivate the patient to brush their teeth better and how to talk to them about the diet and everything. So she went through all of this very carefully asking him if he has gotten more or if he had eaten more sugar because the cavities he had, they were very, very big. And I didn't know if I would be able to save the teeth actually because they were so big and they were close to the nerve and they were close to the bone. And when something is close to the bone, it's more difficult to repair it because it has to be dry when you put the filling. And he didn't change anything in his diet and the cavities came just in a very, very short time in only a year. Normally you don't have you don't see that many cavities that progress that quickly in only a year. And she asked him about everything, his habits of brushing, just everything. And he thought, and he said, nothing has changed. I really, he didn't understand nothing has changed. And he takes very good care of his teeth. He's very good at cleansing them. And what I found very interesting when I saw him was that it was three teeth over here in the right side of the, this, when you look at the x-ray, uh, right is over here and left is over there. And um, only these three teeth were affected. None of the other teeth were affected. And so when I saw him, I got curious because when you have more severe cases or more special cases, it triggers the curiosity to know what goes on in the mind of the patient. And I asked him, and as any good gentleman, when I asked him, have you been stressed? He said, no. <laughs> and, you know, some patients, you have an idea, this patient may not want to know more about his situation, or some patients may be more curious and want to know how can they 
avoid the situation next time. And I thought this guy, he's maybe not so interested. But I, I thought, oh, I tell him anyway, I tell, it's because you're stressed, because he asked me, so why do I have the cavities? And I was very happy to see that the next time he came, because it, it took a lot of time to repair the teeth, so he, he had to come a, a few times. And the next time he came to me, he said, you know what? I thought about your question. And I was delighted <laughs> because I didn't expect it. And he said, I didn't realize, but just two or three months ago, I lost my little brother. But I had never thought of this as being stressed. I just thought of this, you know, it's not this, he didn't think of it as, as a stressing situation, but just a situation that brought him sadness, of course, yeah. But he came to the conclusion himself that his loss of his brother had given him the cavities in his teeth. Isn't it nice? Mm -hmm. I thought it was very nice. I was very, I was very happy. So the question, of course, is, is this man right or is he wrong in his thinking? Oh, no. I mean, more than... oh. <laughs> he, why is he wrong? His body shows that he must be wrong. It could be coincidence. Nothing is a coincidence. You see, disease is a system. Mm. Every electric, every electrical impulse has a road that it must go to because the whole body must be supplied constantly. So there can be no coincidence. Everything functions as a channel. And if just one channel goes wrong, then everything south of that channel or away from the, I don't remember the Latin word of that, but everything on the other side of the broken channel is missupplied or malsupplied or whatever you call it. So there can be no coincidences. You can't, like some diseases are hereditary, or so they say. Well, well, everything we are is inherited, but how we function is by law and not by inheritance. So how we function must be universal for every individual. And when there is not function or dysfunction, it is not inheritance unless in some very few cases, you know, some people are born with disabilities or missing a hand or whatever, and you cannot do anything about that. But if you have disease that appears 10 years after birth or however many years, it can never be inheritance because you have been functioning well up to this point. So something must have broken after birth. Yeah, but you might not have known it until the diagnosis. Well, just the fact that you don't know it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It happens whether you know about it or not. So this man must be wrong because the effect shows that he's wrong. And the question is, because this man, what he thought, what he told me was, I lost my little brother. And this is what we believe as human beings, that we can lose something. And we just saw that the human being cannot bear to lose something. So the thought of loss will bring us disease. disease. And this means that the thought of loss must be what? Wrong. Can the human being ever lose anything? We see this man believes he has loss. We see the effect of that belief. If the effect of what we believe is bad, then what does that tell us about the belief? Bad. Bad. It's wrong. Bad. It's wrong. The human being cannot lose anything. <laughs> the human being cannot lose anything because he cannot bear to lose anything. He only functions well when he is not in loss. So the wrong effect shows us that the thought of loss must be a wrong thought. Yeah? I don't think that's the real world because 
pretty well did all this stuff all the time, and I wouldn't want the other thing to be doing. And there's not much you can do, you know. So thanks so much, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yes, it's a hard problem to solve. It's a problem with a seemingly no solution. But we will get to the solution when we move on further. But the car crashes into your car, that's it. You're going to lose your car and probably your life too, mate. Yeah, but the thing about people is that they don't function the same way as cars, yeah? Because you must be in charge of your own system. Someone else is in charge of the car because the car cannot drive himself, yeah? <laughs> so the human being does not understand his spiritual dependency and this is what gives him trouble we know that the human being has a brain and a body and that human or that brain and that body is dependent on chemical intake and we take food from nature so physically we are dependent on nature to provide for our needs. Now we have a spiritual entity that we haven't known about before. And we know that spiritual entity lives from information and it must, the information must fulfill the need of love, yeah? And so the question is, when we take love to fulfill our need to be able to function, where do we take that love? Yeah. So down here, we are not in trouble about what we are dependent on. But up here, we have great troubles about our dependency. Another good story. It's good with stories. They sometimes illustrate a point. But this is me in the university dentistry school. And um, I recently had a, a patient that reminded me of a situation in school. And you and now I tell you the story and you maybe think about the question, with whose love do you love? Now, to become a dentist was not my big dream. I would have liked to be a doctor. And at some point I thought even about surgery because you know, surgeons are very cool. They can save the world and stuff like that. And um, I thought I'd apply for medical school and I tried a few times and my grades were not good enough and I was not so happy about the situation. But as a good girl, you, uh, when your mom comes with suggestion, you think, oh, well, maybe she's right. And uh, my mom said, oh, you can just be a dentist. It's almost the same. And in the back of my mind, I thought to myself, it's not at all the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's like drilling a tooth, saving the world in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> but when your grades are not good enough, you have no choice. So you, I thought about being a teacher. Also, I really like teaching. I didn't know back then, but I really like teaching. But I'm happy with uh, going to dentistry school now. Back then, I was not so happy. Good dentistry is probably the greatest of all good health. <laughs> that's yeah, that's what they say, at least. But so this is me in dentistry school. And I had a patient, one of my first patients, and I don't think I will ever forget him because here I am, a new um, student at the school, thinking at least I try to the best of my ability to go and save the world. So I, I do whatever I can to care for the patient. And I had this man coming and, and he had the gum disease of periodontitis. And he came a, a few times only. And the first time he came, I think, I think the first time things were all right, actually. But then the second time he came, and you know, with periodontitis, you have this little stick or this little instrument that you put beside the gum, in between the gum and the tooth, and you measure how many millimeters have gone away if the bone has shrunken a little bit. And I've never had periodontitis myself. So, my level of understanding towards this patient might not have been very great, but I thought I was doing my best to not be, you know, you don't want to point it too hard. You're even, we know we have like um, a weight that weighs letters, you know, letters you send in the mail, and then you have to press on the weight with your instrument 
to get adjusted to only press as hard as everyone else. <laughs> I think it's two milligram or something you, you press. And uh, so I was learning on this patient and suddenly he becomes very displeased with me. And he says to me, here I am coming with no pain and now leaving you, I have a lot of pain. <laughs> and immediately my inner nature arised and I thought, here I am giving you the best care I have and look the ingratitude I receive. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say much because when I become a little bit under pressure, I become very quiet. So I was looking to this guy and I was thinking to myself, what am I going to do with him? <laughs> and my teacher came over and he was like, what's going over? Here? What's going on over here? Because the patient was very frustrated with me. And I just explained as neutral as I could, which was, of course, not neutral at all, what was going on. <laughs> and the poor patient... Uh, my 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 uh, my teacher was of course on my side so the poor patient was asked that he if he wanted treatment he could stay and if not he was free to go <laughs> so but the question is of course what did i believe about the love or the care i gave to this man where did i think it came from with whose love did i love at least i believe so yeah so can the human being produce love? How do you know that? How do you know that he cannot produce love? Yes. So to give love, you must take love. Yeah. So if you are the water will. If you are the will of love, would you ever look for love? And does the human being look for love? How much of the time? From we wake up till we go to bed and even in our sleep, you know, in our sleep, we just repeat the lack of love <laughs> that we have gone through the day. If we had any anger, if we had anxiety or something, we go through the information and it's stored into the system. Yeah. So the error we have is subconscious and we must come to know this error so that we can do something about it. The human being is created to be a channel. He must take to give he is dependent on a source outside of himself for whatever he needs, physical and spiritual needs. He must take to give since he has nothing and he cannot create anything. You know, this is why a human being cannot lose anything because he does not own anything. You can only lose something if you own something. Now, yes, well, you can believe you can believe you own something. But when you lose it and you have a wrong effect in your body, that wrong effect shows you that you cannot own anything. Because if you could, if you were made to be the owner of something, you would not have dysfunction from losing something. And when we get trouble from losing, the law must help us understand if there's a wrong effect, that's, then the beginning must be wrong. And the only thing to correct is the understanding that you are the owner of something. So he cannot own anything because he, ha he has nothing. He cannot create anything. He has needs that he must fulfill for correct function and fulfillment of purpose. Let's just see, I have a bit of slides still. I hope we... Don't get too tired. If you need a break at some point, you let me know. We stretch our legs a little bit. Yes, but rebuilding is that creating. That's the transformation. That's the transformation of what is already there. But where would you take the means for that? So who did you make the steel? 
So did you create the vehicle? And what, what would he make the steel from? Yes, did he make the rock? No. no. So can he create anything? You know, we can go this all day long, because in the end, you will realize you do not own the rock and you cannot create the rock. Yeah. So you can take means that are already present and you can do something with them and something will come out in the other end. But you were never the creator. You were the steward of those things. You were remaking them, but you did not create them. Yeah, it would be lovely. We would learn so much. <laughs> so the human being is created. <laughs> Daughter. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> the human being is created as a channel. And this is the truth. This is the right understanding. But now man believes he is independent. He believes that he does not have an entrance. He believes that he can create his, his own love. And we see that because in my situation, I gave something to the patient. And what happened when I didn't receive what I wanted? I was like, all this care I gave him. Yeah? Yeah. Coming from whom? Coming from this little guard over here. Yeah? OK? So man believed he's independent. He started, he started out knowing that he was a channel. But at some point, he thought he's independent. And that means he still gives because he knows, somehow he knows he has to give something. You know, it's put into all of us that we want to give something. I saw a lady on the road the other day. She had fallen over. We were on the way to the supermarket. And um, immediately, the heroin comes up into me, thinking I am the one with the medical knowledge. I thought, I go help this lady. And another lady came by in the car, and she called the ambulance, and everything was taken care of. Somebody had already called the ambulance. I didn't feel much of a heroin after, <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> but help came, and we left the place. But it's put in all of us that when we see the emergency, we want to give something. We want to help out. Yeah. So this stays. But what has been changed in the human being is the understanding that he's a channel. He thinks he has no entrance, so he only gives. But then how does he fulfill his needs? He can't. So now, subconsciously, he doesn't know it, but he still gives. But because he must take from somewhere, he now starts to give in the same end as he takes. Or he, he gives, and then he starts to take, take in the same end that he gives. Is this possible by law? You see, we had the, the structure of the law, the understanding of the law that we have cause on one side, we have effect on the other side, and on this side we can only give, and on this side we can only take. But now I close the entrance, I give, and when I do not have something in this end I can take, I start taking in the other end. Now we have a world full of channels thinking they're independent, trying to give, but they don't have something to give, so they start taking from the other one. And can they take some from something from the other one? Does the other one produce love? When I don't produce love, do you have some love I can live from? No. So this is what gives us issues. And this is the deception. Everyone believes himself to be independent. It's not conscious. I know that I'm not God, but in my heart, in my subconscious, I believe I am. And how do I know? Because I act like one. Yeah. Everyone has to fulfill my needs. Everyone has to obey my commands. Everyone has to be exactly like I want them to be in the right time, at the right moment when I need them to be so. Yeah. I don't know if you ever tested your patients. My patience is tested every day, yeah? I have um, some very nice colleagues and I'm very glad they don't know all of the things that goes on in me. Sometimes when the assistant doesn't bring me what I want, the time I want it, I feel it immediately. It's horrible. 
but I see myself and I'm very happy that most of the time I'm able to abstain from saying something. I don't think I ever expressed my disappointment or my, my lack of satisfaction with my assistance because I know everyone does his very best at work. Do you understand that everyone always does his best? Yeah. So there's no reason to be unsatisfied with the other one. Yeah. And time is not ours. So, but it's very nice to test your own patience and see how many times a day am I unsatisfied because people do not do what I want them to do. The more you search into it, the more sad you will be. <laughs> so we have the deception, I am God. This is what the human being believes about himself. And this is the identity that will not bring us trouble. To understand that I'm a child of God, I am creation and I am not creator, okay? So over here, I believe myself to be spiritually independent of a love source. I believe I have possessions of my own. I believe I can create the love I live from. Over here, I understand that I am spiritually dependent on a love source. I have nothing of my own. <coughs> and I cannot create anything. Over here, I can have personal loss. And I am a victim. And those thoughts will always bring me loss. Those thoughts will always bring me bad emotions, and physical disease. Yeah? <laughs> well, the law proves that if you believe yourself to be a victim, you must be wrong because it shows up in your body. It shows in your body. When you see yourself to be a victim, it will come out as I have eczema on my hands sometimes. It was more severe in school. I have sometimes I have back pain still. Sometimes I have, I when at New Year's, I got tonsillitis. And I don't hurt so much in my throat when I have the tonsillitis, but I have such a fever and I become dizzy and I, oh, I don't like it so much. <laughs> you see that the body shows that when you believe yourself to be a victim, you destroy yourself. And destroying yourself shows that you are outside of the road of health, meaning that you must be wrong in the way you think about things. There's no other way around it. <laughs> well, you don't have to give me anything. <laughs> now, over here, believing that I have nothing I can lose, I will always be happy. Believing that I am never a victim, I will always be happy. Now, is that an easy thing? I tell you, it's the greatest challenge. It's the greatest challenge. Because everyone believes he is the victim of the other one who does not fulfill his needs. But we see from the physical world that no one else can eat for you. No one else can drink water for you. No one else can breathe for you. Now, why would you love, want someone else to then fulfill your need of love? Wouldn't that be stupid? But we all want it. We all want the other one to please us. We all want the other one to be nice and harmonious so that I can drink from him my showers of love. Yeah? Now... We put together the things we learn about the heart of man, about gain and loss, and then the two identities we can have. Yeah. We know that we must avoid loss and we always go for gain. So this is inside our heart, our subconscious. And this is me. I always move towards the gain. Now, if I believe that I am God, what is gain? 
What? Yes. Can loss ever be gain? No. What What is gain in the heart of man? Controlling others. To what? Controlling others. Yes, but why do you want to control the other one? So they can give you something. So that they can give you something. You believe you own something. You believe you can create love yourself. And so you want to receive something because you don't have what you need. Yeah. You didn't take. So gaining must be to receive something to fulfill your need. So you give, but you give to receive. Now loss would be not to receive. To receive less that I want or that someone should take something away from me. This would be loss, yeah? Now, if you understand that you are created and you do not have anything of your own and you cannot create anything, then you will take from the right source and give to the right place and loss would be to not give or to keep something for myself. Do you follow? Yeah. So over here, who is in control of my life? Yourself. Am I? Why not? I'm dependent. Yeah. But dependent on what? Because everyone is dependent. Yeah. On things around me. On things around me, specifically on people around me. Yeah. So over here, I will do anything I can to get what I believe I need. Which means that people can make me do how much? They can make me kill myself. So we saw it in the example Stephanie gave with, with the client she has, yeah? Or not the client she has, but the story she heard from, from someone she, she worked for. If I believe that what I need to take to live is in another person or comes from another person and this other person doesn't give me what I want, they can, to at least a very great extent and many times, make me do many things, maybe even kill myself to fulfill my need of love. What do you think is more important to fulfill your spiritual needs or to fulfill your physical needs? We see it in people all the time. You know what happens to people that are in love? They never sleep. <laughs> they stay up at night talking to their boyfriend or their girlfriend. They don't have any appetite because they're so fuzzy all the time. <laughs> yeah. You see, all our physical needs even life itself is less important to us than our spiritual needs. We see people dying for the cause of righteousness, not because they by accident got killed, but because they stood in the same place and they didn't move because they stood on their case until the end. They defended righteousness, they defended the truth, and they did it to the extent that they were killed. Yeah? So, at any day, the spiritual need must be more important to the human being than fulfilling his physical needs. I know some people get grumpy from not eating, but still, <laughs> it has a spiritual cause. So, if you are independent, you must be God. And this is what we all believe. And when I believe myself to be God, I believe that I can create the love I'll use. I believe I own things and people, and I believe I can then lose something or someone. Like with Stephanie and her grandmother. And I believe I give, but I believe I give from myself, and then others become in debt to me. 
So when I give, I expect that something should come in return. And if I do not receive what I expect from others, I become depressed or anxious or angry or disappointed or hurt. And what will happen after a while if I don't do something about the cause and if the loss is great enough, then there will be a physical manifestation. And if now this uh, gentleman I had, he had the cavities in his teeth, but I know from other cases that people that have lost their children, they come to the doctor one time, they talk about the loss of their child and because they do not correct the idea of not being able to lose anything, six years later, they might come again with cancer. So the truth is about the creator and his creation, that the creator must be independent. He doesn't work according to law. He only gives. He is an actual closed system. He only has an output and not an entrance. He has no needs because he has life in himself. So he does not need to sustain that life with something from the outside. Yeah. He only always gives and he never keeps anything to himself. He has no reason to keep anything to himself because he doesn't need anything. And he is the supplier of the creature. So the creature must take from the creator and he must give to other people and to creation, take care of nature and animals. And the creature was made dependent on the creator as the only way to supply his needs. There is nowhere else he can supply them. The creature takes all things from the creator and he gives to the surroundings. And now the dependency on the creator can bring us no loss because when I understand that I'm a creature, I believe I cannot create anything. I must take from outside. I'm dependent on the creator for life, love, and all things. I always give, but never from myself. I can never lose anything or anyone. And the loss is always the creator's because I'm only the steward of things. I do not own anything. So here, I have no loss. Now, the disease in the children is a very sensitive topic. I had this father coming and asking me, so why does my child get cavities? And I told him, it's because your child is stressed. And he looked to me and he was not happy with my answer. And um, they're still happy with me, but he didn't ask any anymore. Because what do parents believe about their children? They believe them to be their own. So if something is wrong inside the child, does the parent like that you think something is wrong with the child? No. Now, does the child have any choice for the wrong in him? Would he be any different if he wanted to? No. So does the child have any guilt? Is he guilty of his error? No, of course not. Of course not. But the child gets sick because he's stressed. And so where does the child take from? from the mother. So the child is dependent upon the inner life of the mother. And also what happens in society today is that we separate the child from the mother in a too early stage of life or to, before they are, are old enough to be separated from their mother. And is the mother then guilty of the child's disease? 
There is, of course, the pressure of society to go back to work. That's that's one of the things. But is the mom responsible for the life of a child, whether the society tells you what to do or not? Yeah. Yes. But is the mother guilty for her sick children? No. But why not? Because she can't control the world. Well, because the mother does not know. Yeah. No one teaches a mother how to think. Yeah. And another thing is, whenever a mother is unhappy, could she just choose to be happy? She has no choice. So the mother is never guilty for the disease in the children. Never, ever is she. And this is when you talk to the mothers and you tell them, I have a very close friend of mine and we talked about the disease in the children and immediately the mothers go into guilt thoughts. But the mother can never be guilty for the disease of the child because the disease of the child is made by whom? The child himself, yeah? And the mom, of course, has a responsibility to understand why she thinks what she thinks. But when she has uncontrolled feelings or whatever it is, it comes from a subconscious belief that she does not ha know how to take care of, yeah? So we can never look to a child and find a guilty mother, no? But when we look to the child, we see exactly what happens inside mother's heart. I have a few, um, few mothers uh, in the practice where I work with the children, and um, I've asked them a little bit, so how, how do you feel? How is your inner life? And, and most of them, well, not most of them, but the ones I've talked to at least, they, um, they always have a story. Yeah? A story of depression or anxiety or leaving for work too early or whatever. But there's always a story. Yeah. So we must know uh, how the dependency work with the children also, because if we can help the mother understand, you don't see the top so very much, but maybe you still can see that it's a spiritual, spiritual dependency. It begins at conception. So already inside the mother's womb, the child lives from his mother's happiness. We see the physical world shows us exactly what goes on spiritually. So in the physical world, we see the body of the child and we see the body of the mother. And we have this physical umbilical cord that makes sure that whenever mom takes food from nature, the child takes food from the body of mother. Yeah. So there's a, a physical cord that makes sure the child is supplied with his physical needs. And the mother must be dependent on her child or on nature. I will see if I can fix this on my own, but I'm not so sure. Maybe I need a little bit of help. Oh, this one? But nothing is wrong here. There we go. So we see the physical dependency and we have the same dependency in the spiritual world. So the spirit of the child must supply its body with electricity. Yeah. And the spirit of the mother must supply her body with 
electricity. So now we have the electrical input that controls the whole system, every organ. And then we have the spiritual or the physical input or the chemical input that sustains that electrical function, okay? And as in the physical world, so in the spiritual world is there from conception, the moment we have a fetus, we have a spiritual umbilical cord. The child binds itself in trust to the mother. And whenever mom is happy, the child is thrilled. And whenever mother is unhappy, the child will take the information from the mom and the spirit of the child will create electricity that goes to the body of the child. And this is why we see malfunctions in fetuses. So do you think that it is important or do you think that society should have taught a mother how to think? I think society has no idea what they are doing. Exactly. Yeah? So I find this message to be very uplifting because all the things that cannot be solved in the medical world has a solution here. But of course, we must know exactly how things work and how to come from one place to another because we live in captivity and in dependency on other people. And we have to know how to get out of this situation. So the child takes from the mother because she is the only one in society around the child that it can take from. There's no one else inside the belly. It's only mother spirit. And the mom takes her love from where? Who is she dependent on? She binds herself in trust to her husband and she's bound to her mother and her father and to other people around her. So whenever some of these sources of love are not as she needs them to be, the child will know it immediately and he suffers. Now at birth, we see that the physical umbilical cord disappears or we, we cut it, but it would fall itself. Yeah, because it's not needed anymore. So it goes away. And so what happens with the spiritual umbilical cord is that if you do not remove it yourself, you will die with it. You will have it till you go to the grave. The child starts taking chemistry from outside because he is now not connected to mom anymore. He can take the food and eat it, or when he's put to the breast, he can feed himself. So he starts taking responsibility for his own needs. And the only way to help the child become independent of the, the only way to get the child out of his dependency from mom is that mom would know how spiritual dependency is changed. Yeah, If mother doesn't know how to get rid of the dependency on the people around her, will she be able to tell the child how to do it? Of course not. So the education of the child when he becomes old enough is to teach the child what mom is te teaching herself also, or learning from, from God, how to be dependent on the right source of love so that the child will no longer be dependent on its parent. Do you think that's a great responsibility or a little responsibility? <laughs> it's the greatest responsibility that was ever given to man on earth. 
The woman has the greatest responsibility given to any person on earth. But she thinks to herself, no, let me go and work instead. Yes, yeah, she told to, but it's a challenge. I mean, I know from myself, the thought of having to stay home only. I take off my life, I leave my career, I leave everything, and I decide to only live for this child. Easy decision or not so easy. Maybe for some it's easier and for some it's more difficult, yeah? I, I think it's a challenge, yeah? But when we put babies into the world, we must know the responsibility of how to raise them, of what it is that we need to teach them. So the education of the child is to remove the trust between mother and child and take from another source, which is a stable source that always provides what you need. Yeah? I just illustrate a little bit because to fulfill its needs, the child binds itself to everyone around him. And how fast does he do this when he's come into this world? Straight away. Yeah? So mother is the first dependency. And this child takes from mom. And then father is the next. And maybe the grandparents or if there are any siblings. You see the twins, if they're brought up and they lie in the same bed and you then separate them. Does it go well? No, they, they are dependent on the presence of the other twin. Yeah. And the spirit of their friends when they become old enough to have friends. And then the child starts demanding. And how fast does he start demanding? <laughs> From he comes out, <laughs> he starts crying because he wants food or he starts crying because Someone is unhappy, or he starts crying because he needs to have his diaper changed. Yeah. So he demands from everywhere and everyone, and from the grandparents, and from the siblings, and from the spirit of friends. And if you grow up to be a, a Christian, you will demand also from God. Mm. But the child does not have a choice. Because he is born like this. Yeah. So when I had the girl in my practice with the toy, I mean, mothers are not the only one who can become frustrated with the children. It also happens to me. <laughs> Sometimes I just want it over. <laughs> yeah. But I know by reason that if you push the sinful nature, will it obey? No, it pushes back. Yeah. So I had another girl also a few years ago. Well, actually in the beginning when I just started being the dentist in the children's department. And um, she was a little bit older. So I thought maybe I can reason with her. And the mother was very anxious and a little upset and the home was split up. The girl stayed sometimes with the father and sometimes with the mother. And it was obvious even when they came to the practice that there was not harmony between the two. And while they were standing in the corner and fighting, I thought this is my chance. You know, sometimes you talk to the child when the parents don't hear it because sometimes you can make a deal with them or sometimes you learn what goes on without the parents interfering. And um, I thought, I just push her a little bit, not so much, just a little bit and see if I can get her to do what I want. And so I asked her, is it because you do not want your teeth to be fixed? <laughs> I, I was a little less hard than that. And I tried, you know, to put the patients when you touch them nicely and it's a little bit easier for them, especially the children. And so she looked at me and she said, I want to, but I don't want to. And it brought me almost to tears because I saw myself in this girl. You know, the nice thing about children is that they just spill out what's on their heart when you ask them. 
Because what that girl said is how every person in this world feels every day. When they lose control over themselves, they say, I want to have control, but I have no control. I want to be healthy, but I cannot take the means into, you know, I cannot do what I know is good. I want to be friendly. I want to forgive. I want to be good, but I don't want to, or I cannot. Do you recognize that phrase from somewhere, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Isn't it nice? Right there lying in my dentistry chair, I have Roman seven in a little girl who cannot say much, but she speaks exactly the problem of humanity. I thought it was very, very nice. So we know that disobedience, no matter the age of the patient or the child or the adult is sin. But the question is, do we have a choice? Are we guilty? I think these are very important questions. And as time has flied by, we finish here and we think about these questions for tomorrow and look into the inescapable problem of humanity. I hope you had some time and some time outside of the, the seminars also to just think a little about the things that's been said and tomorrow we go into understanding exactly where the problem lies and also if there is a solution to the issue so i think this is it for tonight thank you